So, um, uh, welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Nasser Kasuri, and I am a director and board member of the Beacon House School System. Um, on behalf of the Beacon House School System, which is the organizer of the School of Tomorrow events, I'd like to welcome you to a world of tomorrow from darkness to light, which is the 12th edition of SOT events. And it's fully virtual this morning for obvious reasons. Uh, the nonprofit SOT event series was launched by Beacon House in 2000 as part of our CSR and to help inform the direction of the organization while also engaging global communities and conversations, shaping the future of societies uh, and schools. I'd like to welcome our viewers uh, to this discussion and remind you that you can post questions at any time during the event. We will endeavor to answer as many of them as possible at the end of the session, which will be half an hour, after which we'll hopefully get to the questions. So basically, um, you know, getting on to the session uh, uh, topic itself, uh, it is, uh, you know, it's always been believed rightfully that learning should be about goals. However, those goals, uh, um, you know, and however, how those goals are set and what direction they are taking should depend on the learner more than the teacher. Uh, without giving ample consideration to the child's needs and preferences, education and learning cannot bear the desired expected results. So shedding uh, some light on this matter today with us is uh, Dr. Roger Shank. Um, Dr. Shank has been um, a mainstay of the SOT events since their very inception. Um, I, I think we've hardly had a an SOT event without Dr. Shank, and he's always enlightened us with his views. Uh, Dr. Shank is an American artificial intelligence theorist, cognitive psychologist, educational reformer, learning scientist, and entrepreneur. Dr. Shank is perhaps one of the world's greatest proponents of letting children, uh, children's needs and preferences uh, drive education. I'd like to again welcome you to the session, Dr. Shank. Uh, you know, thank you for joining us again in this SOT, and I'm sure, as always, it's going to be an in, in extremely interesting conversation. Um, so just to sort of set the tone a little bit, um, you know, as uh, one of traditional education's uh, harshest critics, you founded a number of your own educational companies, such as Cognitive Arts Corporation, the Socratic Arts, the XTOL, which is, I believe, stands for Exponential Training Online, so I, I was just wondering if you can share some your vision behind some of these organizations and what have been some of their success and what have been some of the challenges you faced? Well, uh, I have to tell you that my, my vision for these things is probably delusional. Um, I always imagined that what would happen is, and this happened when Arthur Anderson hired me to go to Northwestern in 1990, that, that I would get people, grown-ups, to see what education should look like, to see what, to create good training, and say, and have them say, in the end, why, well, this stuff is really great. Why don't my kids look and learn like this? That's never happened. I mean, I'm doing very well with training. We have lots of major big clients fixing their training. Schools never ask me for help. Schools already know all the answers to everything. And this is a problem, because you can't budge them. Even if you get to um, the head of schools like you guys. It's all very well good, but the parents are who your problem is, and the parents are conservatives. I remember meeting parents. Are we still here? I believe so. Uh, I'm not sure if it's choppy on my end or your end. It was your voice was a little bit intermittent. Can you hear me? Yeah, well, no, I'm, I see the picture is back. So I, oh, I, remember, I remember talking at uh, your conferences, and once you introduced me to your parents, the parents of your kids. And whereas the teachers and your people who run the place all understood me and agreed with me, your parents didn't want to hear it. Your parents had only one question. Will the kid get into Oxford? Hmm. And that's the problem with education worldwide. All anyone's concerned about is, will they get into Harvard? Will they get into whatever their favorite school is? As if that's a good thing. And the reason they think it's a good thing is they want to stamp their name, stamp Harvard on their, on their forehead. Well, if you meet somebody who went to Harvard, they'll tell you they went to Harvard within two seconds. What <laughs> happened at Harvard that was so wonderful, I don't know, but it makes them important. 
and same with Oxford and Cambridge and any other school which has that kind of reputation. So as long as we consider school to be something preparatory to college, which everyone agrees it is, school can't be fixed because school should not have anything to do with college. College is college, high school is high school. Can we teach kids what they want to learn in school up until before they go to college? Also in college would be a good idea too. We, we, we can't seem to want to teach them what they want to learn because the teachers are in charge and the teachers and the parents are in charge and everyone thinks that what was there before is perfect. My favorite example is whenever I give a lecture these days, imagine a thousand people in the audience and I was, I'll start with, Okay, who knows the quadratic formula? And you the get, quadratic formula is your favorite example. <laughs> favorite example. I love it. And you have, you have maybe three or four parents will raise their hands, and I'll say, okay, tell it to me. And they will always tell me the Pythagorean theorem. <laughs> because they don't remember what they learned. And they, if they remember, the, and if they actually think they know the quadratic formula, sometimes they say it. And I say, that's ridiculous. Why do you know it? They said, because my kid was studying for the tests and I was tutoring him. We insist on teaching nonsense like the quadratic formula, which is of no use whatsoever, and pretend mm -hmm. it's important. So hundreds of kids go through, or thousands of, tens of thousands of kids go through high school and think, I'm very stupid because math is very hard. How about because you don't care? And how about because you don't need it? Why don't we ask kids what they want to learn? Mm -hmm. So uh, tell me, I mean, absolutely, that makes uh, you know a lot of sense. Um, you know, of course, first, you know, when we were talking about university admissions, you know, unfortunately, I think the, you know, the reality is that there's so many different um, stakeholders that actually expect, you know, good grades and test results in order to let, you know, kids get in. And then that subsequently, you know, affects their employment, employability. So, you know, I think it's not entirely unreasonable of parents. I don't think they just want their children to go to good universities, uh, you know, for bragging rights. But, you know, it's it's genuinely a gateway to a better future for them. So yes, how, it is. It is. How, you know, how can balance the two really, right? Because, you know, it's not like universities can, you know, change overnight as such, right? They're, they're, you know, I wish they would, in fact. I, I wish they put their money where their mouth is and have, you know, have more diverse admission criteria than they do, but they don't currently. So that puts schools in a different, difficult situation. So, you know, you know, one has to sort of balance ground realities with, with what you're saying, which we all acknowledge. So how does one find that balance? Well, you know, the problem is I was working with a school in Florida and I met the parents and the parents did the same thing they did when I met with your parents. Um, the reality is that, uh, and they said, well, I won't get into Harvard. I said, this school has never sent anyone to Harvard in the history of the school. Could you get on to some other subject? No. And, and, and one of the problems we have here is that people don't understand what school is for. And there, there is a high school in New York City called Aviation High School. Aviation High School happens to be next to Kennedy Airport. And it was created as a way of producing people who would work at Kennedy Airport. They learned various job skills related to working at an airport. And they'd all go work, get a job after high school, work in the airport. Well, it was shut down. I mean, it still exists, but it no longer does that because it wasn't diverse enough. All the students were black and Puerto Rican. So therefore, it was bad. And the fact they were getting jobs wasn't considered at all. And they should be going to college. Why? This nonsense about college. Let me tell you about college. You can't change college. Okay, so I was a professor most of my life until I couldn't stand it anymore. It's the easiest job in the planet. The professors have their own maps constantly. They don't have to do any more teaching they want to. They protect the, their subjects by requiring you to major in something. So you have to study in order to get into my advanced class, you have to take these elementary classes. And all the professors ever want to do is teach their advanced class because it's what they're thinking about now. They don't want to teach the kid. They don't care about the kids. They, they care about this is the, the teaching isn't really their job. At a good university, the job of a, a professor is publishing and doing research, and teaching is an irrelevancy. So part of the problem here is getting universities to change. And as it happens, when Donald Trump was running for president four years ago, I knew his campaign manager, so I went to visit him. And he said, well, what would you do in education? And I said, I will write out an education policy for Donald Trump, which Donald Trump never saw because Donald Trump doesn't listen to anybody saying anything. But my, my education policy was um, 
First thing you do is you get all the presidents of all the major Ivy League schools into a room and you tell them, if you don't stop your silly requirements, your SATs, your three years of this and four years of that and blah, 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 you won't get any more federal funding. You have to stop screwing up the high school system. That would change it in a minute. I'm not telling you any president would ever do that, but that would change it in a minute. No, I mean, that's uh, that's true. It, it is going to, uh, you know, the universities, unfortunately, their admission requirements do have uh, exert pressure on, on what schools uh, teach at the end of the day. Okay, so one of my questions is, you know, um, you know, you're, and I've, I've asked you um, uh, this before, and, you know, I'm, to be honest, I'm not sure if I'm totally satisfied with the answer yet. Um, so I'm going to ask it again. Um, you know, the, the, you know you, you're presuming that, you know, uh, kids, even like younger kids, you know, it's, it's a separate matter, you know, at college, you've been, you know, you're older, you've kind of seen the world. But, you know, if you're talking about everyone, including young kids, there's like a presumption that, you know, they kind of, you know, know what they want to do, right? And oh, then they should... that's, that, that's absolutely true. And sorry, you have children? Oh, I, I do have children, yeah. And your children haven't told you one way or another what they want to do? I know, but it does keep changing also, right? And, and not because of any pressure I'm putting on them. Um, you know, a lot of, you know, if my, you know, if, if my if my son wants to be a pizza delivery man because he likes pizza, not that he wants to be a pizza delivery man, then, I mean, it, you know, the, 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 it may at, at a very young age, you know, be motivated by, by something which he himself will realize when he's older is is not really very valuable and he may want to do something more meaningful well, for then him. Let him change. Let him change. But when he wants to do something when he's six, you let him do it. If you love doing this, do it. If you love doing that, do it. I had two children. They both love doing something. I let them do it. What do they do now? What I let them do. Okay? My son just loves subways. All he wanted to do is ride on subways all day long. Well, now he's the chief innovation officer for the Los Angeles Transportation System. Because that's all he cares about. And his entire goal in life is to run the New York subway system, which he may get to eventually. But no, I, I, I was going to get to that, actually. Um, but, I'll, you know, I'll get to it now, perhaps. So, you know, and, and again, it, you know, there, there's another question, I think, in Pakistan, you know, where parents feel that they have, you know, they should have some role to play or very strong role sometimes, probably too much of a role to play in what career decisions you're their children make. You've taken the example of your son. This is uh, something you mentioned last time as well. In fact, you, um, I, I, you know, I found that perhaps there's a bit of a contradiction in that because the last time we discussed this, you actually said that your son wanted to be a history major when he went to, went to college and you told him that it's the most useless profession in the world. And that, you know, you, you, you essentially you know, sort of suggested to him that since his passion since childhood had been subways, that's what he should do. So in do and then you, you know, similar sort of, um, you know, uh, story with your daughter, I believe, who wanted to be an English major, but you, you know, you, you discouraged her and she's, she's an author now, but, you know, she, I think, did literature or something, uh, not an English major. So don't you see that as a contradiction? You yourself. No, not at all. Your role in guiding your children. Not at all. Not I, was, I was overriding the school system, the college system. I was not, I was listening to them and overriding it. So Columbia University was selling the value of a history major. My son listened to him. When I, when I said he couldn't be a history major, he said, well, let's be. And I said, you should major in subways. He said, well, how do you do that? I said, well, why don't you find out? Columbia, nobody at Columbia was asking what he wanted to do. They gave him a set of choices. And so they make these really ridiculous choices. Same thing with my daughter. She didn't want to study literature. She wanted to write. So being a, it sounds sensible to be an English major, but it isn't. These majors are set up by professors who don't have any practical abilities anyway. What does a history professor know how to do? So it, it isn't very useful to be a history major. And I, what I'm saying is that let kids, I, let kids do what they want to do. I'm doing something like that right now. I wrote about it on LinkedIn the other day. We're building a modding, a modding curriculum. And what's a so modding? What are you doing, sorry? A modding. Is the modding, modding, modding curriculum. Modding. Okay. modding. Cool. I, I never heard of it. I never heard of it. But one of, my, one of the people who works for me, who's worked for me her whole life, has a kid who's a pain in the ass. He's always in trouble in school. He doesn't want to, he doesn't like this. He doesn't do that. And they're so frustrated. 
and he guess he's not going to get into college. I said, what does he like to do? He likes to take things and change them. He likes to take keyboards and make ver different versions of keyboards, to so take computer hardware and change the things it does. So it turns out, when I started to talk to him, first of all, he was very smart, very articulate, and he, had, he cared about this. So we're building him a curriculum that teaches him what he wants to know. And it turns out he's not the only kid who wants to do that. There's lots of kids that do it. They're self-educated through the things they find on YouTube, and they hang out with other kids who want to do the same thing. It sounds crazy to me, but he likes it. And how is it going to hurt him to get involved in something that he likes and get better at it and become and think hard about it? This is what I want. I don't care what you're doing as long as you're excited and thinking hard. Okay. So is there, I mean, is there, are there a set of base skills that you uh, believe that people do need to have, um, you know, in order to really, as a foundation, to get anywhere in life? Well, that's a trick question because what, what that question is is, so shouldn't we, if you, if you say it's very important to be able to do X, let's teach X. No, no, I'm not doing that. I'm letting you do things you want to do. I'm, if you want to do something, I'm going to help you do it. In the meantime, while you're learning it, you may need to, some skills that, that you need. Fine, well, then you can learn them just in time. What, the whole just in time notion has been lost about the internet. What the internet is is a value resource for teaching you things right the minute you need to know them. And a lot of times you don't know what, what things those are because then something just happened in the news or some new event that, you know, that you're just touching on. What you want is computers to be smart enough, and this is my AI background, to be able to see who you are and let you know what interesting stuff you might be interested in. Like a good friend who sees you trying to do something and says, well, you know, you should look at this. That's what I want school to be. I don't I mean, that's not to be school. I want education to be. And I want kids to be able to choose something they want to do and do as much of it as they want until they're tired of it and want to move on or until they've reinvented the wheel. Whatever it is, I want them to be excited by what they do. And what I'm watching it now with my grandchildren going to remote school where they're being blabbered at about nothing. My oldest grandson, who's 15, is complaining that they're talking to him about European wars, which as far as he can tell, well, Christians killing other Christians, and he doesn't care. And I said, well, you shouldn't care. What do you care about who, when the Protestants are fighting the Catholics? Well, that's what they teach. Why? Because they decided to teach it. And, and so they spend all their time teaching things that no one cares about. My, not only my daughter is a writer, but her daughter is a writer too. She's 11. She can't stop writing. So let her write. So over that, what would she learn? I don't know. Well, if she writes about something, she might say it wrong. She might do it wrong. She might not understand. She might have to look things up. It's nothing important that you have to learn. This skill of communication is important. But we always have to, we should, kids are always should be trying to communicate. The skill of reasoning is important because we should be putting them in situations where they have to figure things out. But it isn't, you don't want to let them make a list of skills because then it'll be an argument of 50 things that every kid must know and then there'll be a PISA test. The PISA test, by the way, is the most evil test on the planet. The fact that we have an international organization like OECD making every kid take a test so we can compare countries to country on how well they memorize the quadratic formula is insane. Well, they, they, I, I, I suppose uh, PISA would argue that they're trying to um, now change their tests so that, they, that they're able to test children's deeper understanding of concepts and also test skills. So I, I suppose, not that they're, they're here, but you know, we had people from PISA at the last SOT, you, you, know, you perhaps recall them, and they spoke at length about how the tests are not just trying to test like rote memorization essentially. So do you believe the tests have improved at all or are they as bad as they've always been really? All tests are bad. There shouldn't be tests. Why do we have tests? When you're, we, 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 the only rational uh, government agency about testing is the Motor Vehicle Bureau. The people decide that you should have a driver's license. They have a stupid test like everybody else. Someone also watches to see if you can drive a car. The only test worth doing is can you do it? Let's see if you can do it. And you know, is there a teacher test? Well, there might be, but shouldn't the right teacher test be, I'll watch you teach and see what I think and suggest that you make improvements? I mean, why do we have to have tests? As soon as you have a test which is filling in a blank or multiple choice or any of this stuff, you've just ruined all education. You've made people think that what's important is getting good grades on tests. Well, it's not at all important, stop it. The only reason it's important is because colleges don't wanna work hard at admissions. So they have to they have to have these numbers by your name so they can they can they can uh, 
not have to actually interview you or see who you are. I can remember when I went to college, they predicted that I would have a 2.15 grade point average based upon the fact that I didn't do that well in high school. My SATs weren't so good, so I was going to have a C average. Well, I beat them. I got a 2.14 grade point average because <laughs> I didn't give a damn. I was never interested in grades, high school, college, or any other time. It's not important. But we have a society which tells you it's important. You, you said something interesting. The only, uh, you know, this, I'm just going to try to stretch this to a, a bit of an extreme, really. You said, you know, the only, like, sensible test is one where you actually see someone doing it. So let's take, for example, like um, professions, um, critical professions like healthcare. I mean, it would be difficult to argue that the best way to see if a heart surgeon can do heart surgery is to get him to do heart surgery on someone because if he can't do it, the person will likely die. You know, there, there are situations in which you do need to be absolutely certain that someone can do something without putting them in a situation where they actually have to do it. So you it's think, you it's, think it's, I'm it's, it's, it say that all tests are evil. I mean, there's instances in which they're absolutely indispensable, really, aren't they? Uh, no, I don't agree at all. The, 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 there are plenty of medical tests, the tests to get into medical school, more multiple choice, choice memorization, garbage. They don't have reasonable tests. Doctors don't pass a test to become a doctor. The reality is that somebody's watching you and seeing how you're doing in medical school, not that you know all the bones, but how you do in various circumstances. So you put them on, not uh, you don't have them immediately jump into brain surgery, but they can be an assistant brain surgeon for a while. We can see how they do, how we evaluate each other all the time as people. Yeah. And, and the right. fact is that, that that's not a bad thing to do. We should be able, we should know that. But this great thing, I mean, I, when I was at Yale and I did graduate admissions, as soon as someone applied with all A's, I rejected them immediately. And mm -hmm. the reason is, if you got all A's, it means all you need to do is study and memorize, study and memorize. You should have something you're more interested in than something else and something you mm -hmm. blow off because it didn't make any sense. But if you can get mm -hmm. it in every single course, you're just a rule follower. You're not going to come up with any, anything interesting. I don't want you in my graduate program. I want interesting ideas. And you can't give a test for do you have interesting ideas. You actually have to listen to the ideas and think about them and discuss them. That's fair enough. That's, that's, uh, that's a good point. Um, okay, I, I want to uh, move on to uh, uh, education technology a little bit. You know, it's, it's something that, you know, I think uh, since, since, uh, you know, since the first SOT, you know, you've been a tremendous proponent of education technology. And I think that, I think it's since that time, I mean, the world has changed in unthinkable ways. Uh, and, 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 you know, now we kind of are seeing the use of education technology more and more. Um, and I think you've even made, you know, um, uh, comments um, uh, in the past about how you feel, you know, the traditional schooling system is even more perhaps obsolete because of education technology and how, you know, AI can at some stage replace, you know, uh, human beings in traditional teaching roles. Um, you know, I mean, if any, if if the pandemic has has shown me anything, it's that you know students don't engage online uh, the way they do in a physical environment. Um, you know, when they're with their peers and they're learning in groups and they're working with each other, um, which is really what I believe where real learning takes place. It's very difficult to simulate that effectively online. And I found that the only thing technology is really good at doing at this stage is very basic didactic teaching, which doesn't, doesn't that fundamentally go against the type of teaching that you are proponent of anyway? So I'm wondering, yeah, I, I, if you could share your views on that, really. Well, I would say that this pandemic is killing on online education because instead of actually trying to do it right, they're doing it as wrong as they can possibly do it. Remote learning now means everyone will be on a Zoom call and you'll, I'll be staring at your face to make sure you're paying attention. Now, your average kid in school is not paying attention, but his, his teacher can't, can't look at every face. So he's passing notes. He's making jokes with his friends. He's doing a whole range of things, of which the, cl the class is the most unimportant thing he can do. He's having fun in school because he's hanging out with the other kids and doing things with other kids. The reality is online education could be good, but they're not, not operating any good online education. The only online education they're doing is remote teaching, which isn't even close to what I'm talking about when I talk about online education. When I talk about, about online education right now, we have a cybersecurity course, for example, funded by the Defense Department. What do we do? 
we put you in a situation which you can't figure out until you now figure it out. Something's mm -hmm. happened. We've just been attacked. Fix it. I don't know anything about this. Okay, figure it out. Mm -hmm. well, I need some help. Well, you have a question? All right. Maybe I'll answer your question. Maybe I won't. But I'll put you in there. In six months of behaving like that, and you get hired as a cybersecurity expert because you are one because you've been mm -hmm. – you have dived in and, 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 and learned how to do it. I'm not going to give you a lecture about cybersecurity. You have to actually know how to figure out when something's happening, why it's happening, and how it's happening. And the remote learning we have now is worse than I ever could possibly imagine. So what we're doing is killing off just like you just said, oh, online education doesn't work. Well, that doesn't work. Who ever said that? I was never promoting teachers blabbering at you. In no course do I have a teacher talking, ever. What we have is mentors people who can help you when you need it. And other than that, they leave you alone. My company is called Socratic Arts for a reason. They teach Socratically. What does that mean? It means when you ask a question, we don't necessarily even answer it. We just say, well, what do you think? Well, how would you work that out? It's not about knowing answers. Answers are useless. And so as long as you think remote teaching is what it's now become because of the pandemic, we've just ruined it forever. But what about what about younger kids? I mean, it's it's like you know I've seen younger kids, uh, you know, when they're trying to learn using technology, they struggle just to uh, just to manage the hardware and to use it effectively. It's it's you know um, when we're talking about education, of course, we're not just talking about engineers using technology in in the way that you described. We're talking about kids right from the start. So, do you think that um, the the traditional Break and mortar education um, and and a physical learning environment is more meaningful and more relevant for younger kids and will retain that relevance because of the way younger kids learn. Well, I think it's not fun to be by yourself all day. So if a kid is going to be uh, learning, let's have them be with other kids who are trying to learn the same stuff. But the problem mm -hmm. that we have is that we always want every kid to learn exactly the same stuff, no matter who they are. We need to ask, who are you? What do you like to do? I was on a, a cruise recently, um, and I had nothing to do, so I interviewed everybody. I asked everybody, what did you like to do when you were a little kid? One after the other said, puzzles. I like to do puzzles. So then I asked people what they did now. Every person who said puzzles was a doctor. Okay? And you can see the relationship between puzzles and doctors. So I want to build the puzzle curriculum. That lets kids who like to do puzzles do puzzles and to then move on into medical issues and doing diagnosis. And they could be doing diagnosis when they're 12. They, they don't have to become doctors at 12, but they don't have to go through memorizing phyla in biology class or SP3 binding in chemistry class, which has nothing whatever to do with being a doctor. But it's, what the, stu it's the stuff we make the kids do before they go to medical school. There's no reason for it. Every piece of the system is designed for no good reason just the way we always did it. And it turns out the curriculum we're teaching is pretty much the same curriculum the Romans taught to create orators in the forum. It's what they call it the artist liberalis curriculum. Sound familiar? But well, we still are pushing this idiotic curriculum and learn history, learn philosophy, learn literature, so you can give a speech in the forum. But we don't have anyone giving speeches in the forum anymore. Now we have people with a different world. And do, learning to interact with the kids is important. Yes, that should be part of it, for sure. But it shouldn't necessarily mean sitting to quietly with a bunch of other kids listening to a teacher talk. That's what it should not mean. Um, absolutely. Okay, so just um, uh, just moving. So, you know, one of the issues that that struck me while you were talking is, you know, that the you know that the world already, particularly you know, developing countries, um, are fa facing tremendous resource constraints in in terms of you know teaching faculty. Um, and generally, uh, you know, as educators and beacon house, what we found is that when you have much more teacher led learning and when you are letting each student be a self directed learner, it is resource intensive. You need more teachers. You generally need, small, you need smaller classes. You need more personalized attention. The mentorship role that you're referring to is actually far more challenging um, and it requires more time than traditional teaching. So how can you realistically, especially let's say in, in a Pakistani context, we have a developing country, don't have resources, really realistically expect to 
you know, give, you know, over 200, you know, like, you know, about what, like 70 or 80 million children, mm -hmm. um, you know, individualized learning plans, which, you know, are specifically catered to, you know, how they want to learn. Is that really doable? Yes, it's doable. And Pakistan is just as doable as Pakistan as anywhere else. I know you don't want to do it, but it's, it, it is absolutely doable. Why? It's doable because you, when you have a teacher who's standing in front of a class all day, that's a lot of work, and they're teaching 30 kids, and classrooms are a bad idea. That's the first problem. But imagine that you had that same teacher who was an expert in something, doesn't matter what, and they were mentoring a lot more than 30 kids because not every kid has a question every minute, and they're not, and they're not all there at the same time. So we have been doing mentoring for a long time. You can remember, mentor hundreds of kids in your specialty because they're not asking questions every two seconds. And you're not lecturing them, so you have the time to do it. And this is not a technology issue at all. It's not an equity issue. You could do it in Pakistan just fine. You won't do it because you want to be a school that sends kids to Oxford. I know that. But the fact of the matter is that you have to do it. Someone has to do it. It probably won't be Pakistan, but it'll be somebody. So you're arguing that it's actually easier and less resource intensive to do this than traditional education. I would say it's about the same resources. You need about as many teachers as you ever needed. Um, the, 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 we have in our cybersecurity, we keep training cybersecurity mentors. Typically, they're the guy who graduated the class the last, the last session, and now they mentor like the next kids. It's not hard to do it. And, and, and so what you have problems with is, what we have problems with is that the work is very hard. You want to learn cybersecurity, you're going to work all day, every day for six months. Kids aren't used to working like that. They're used to... Listen, sitting back, listening to a lecture and trying to cram some in their head before the test and passing a test, in which case they don't have to do any actual work. This system worked fine for me. I was lazy and I didn't want to do any work in school. I never did and I got through. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm, I'm also aware of the fact that we have to start taking questions soon. So we'll continue this conversation. But if the uh, moderators want to start posting questions, um, in the chat window, I'm, I'm happy to start uh, taking them now. Um, but let's continue until they do that, certainly. Um, so, um, you know, one of the conversations uh, going on Dr. Shank in, in Pakistan right now, and I think it kind of does link to the conversation we're having, uh, is there's this, like, you know, tremendous tussle uh, between, um, you know, the government and, you know, private schools in terms of, you know, how education should be approached. And, you know, the, the you know, the government is and not just private schools. I would say, in fact, uh, a lot of intellectuals also have critiqued the government uh, over their, uh, you know, intention to make a single national curriculum. And it's the government's argument that one of the roles of education should also be to create national cohesion and to give people an equal playing field and to create some degree of unity um, in society. Um, well, that's clear what the government position is, because the government position is the same in every country. I want you to think our country is the best country in the world. And I will tell you that 5,000 different times in 5,000 different ways and how our enemies think. And that's what they care about. They don't care about education. They care about making people who are, do what they're told, sit down, shut up, and be patriots. And the classic mm -hmm. example of this in my country is every day, every single day, kids get up and they pledge allegiance to the flag with their hand mm -hmm. over their heart, and they say, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. Now think about that. You're five years old. Do you know what the word pledge means? Do you know what the word allegiance means? So they interview the kids and ask them, to tell, what are they saying? And most of them think they're saying, I led the pigeons to the flag. <laughs> and and well, we were happy with that. In fact, I saw something on Facebook just yesterday where the kids not going to school, so they're not pledging allegiance. So how are they learn to love America? This is terrible. And the parents are always sitting there saying, whatever we did in school was perfect and wonderful. We have to keep doing it. Governments do not give a damn about educating people. They give a damn about having compliant citizens and people who will go join the army when we need you. And th this is ridiculous. There's no reason not to, uh, to think about what jobs there are in our country and do it. I can remember one visit to Pakistan. I was talking to whatever government leader you happen to have at that meeting. And he said, you know, we supply all the telecommunications workers all around the world. And we don't have a single telecommunications course in Pakistan. <laughs> and I thought, you know, if you know you're supplying the telecommunications workers, why don't you teach them how to do it? No, you know. 
no i mean that's that's true so i mean you you would argue that um national cohesion and the national agenda really has no place in education then absolutely none absolutely none okay every national agenda is identical i want my country to be future strong <laughs> kill everybody we don't like <laughs> fair enough fair enough uh someone just uh, said that the pizza delivery man is uh, offended i i didn't mean to offend any uh, pizza delivery man uh, for sure and and i and i do apologize to anyone if i did offend them sometimes you say things in in these conversations which uh, you know uh, are misinterpreted or don't come out exactly as you intended um we have a couple of questions i think both of them are fairly related and i think you we have kind of touched on this but maybe we can speak about this a bit more uh, you know balance of you know letting kids do what they want to do and you know and getting jobs and and the thing is you know um dot shank your uh, children may have had interests that subsequently lent themselves to you know putting them into productive careers but it is entirely possible that you know someone is interested in something which will not get them a job which will provide them no, you know I don't think that. stability I don't or think that. stable income no because if you're into whatever you're interested in if you're intensely interested in it there's something that can come out of that it doesn't matter what it is you like drawing pictures you can become an artist you like building bridges with blocks you can become an engineer it's not true i got into a fight with somebody in florida right there because they had a kid who was smoking marijuana and not going to school and cheating and they were very concerned so they brought him to see me I always get the bad kids for, to get. And I stopped there and talked to him for half an hour, and I thought, oh, what he really wants to do is be a car mechanic. He really wants to fix cars. So I said to the parents, let him go, introduce him to some nearby mechanic, and let him work at the garage. No, he has to go to college. I said, well, maybe if he does that, he'll want to become a designer of cars. Would you let him do what he wants to do now? No. So they sent him off to military school to discipline him. That worked real well for Donald, too. I, I, I mean, the idea that you have the kid, the kid is not motivated to earn a living is never true. This kid was interested in cars. There's plenty of livings to be made working for car on cars in any of its aspects. And he was a smart kid, so maybe he'd be a car designer. But the issue for us is to have to find out what the kid wants to do and let him do it. And and, and and nobody, even if a kid just wants to play video games all day, so ask him to design video games. He'll probably be excited by that. It's not complicated to take an interest and move it into something that's practical. Or even play video game tournaments. These days, you can make a lot of money. My son loves video games. He just told me very proudly yesterday that uh, there's a Fortnite tournament going on, and the top prize is like two million dollars. And uh, I think if he wins that, I will let him become a professional video gamer after that. <laughs> even if he even if he loses that, if he has something he wants to do so badly, don't you think he has to think hard about how to be good at it? Wouldn't, why don't you have conversations of what, about with him about what strategies will have him win this game, and what does he have to do? That's called thinking. And instead of having, making you think about what happened in history a thousand years ago, let's think about what you want to think about. He wants to think about video games. Fine, let him think about video games. I mean, so you know, but, but you know, uh, I just like to take off from that a little bit. In fact, I used to. I mean, myself when I was younger, uh, I used to love playing video games. Um, I'm glad I didn't make a career out of it. um at the, at this stage um isn't there a danger for example if my if i like my son spend too much time doing what he wants to do at the expense of learning other base skills that subsequently if he decides that it's not his life calling he will not have the foundational knowledge required oh, to play like this is nonsense what school what skills are you worrying about if, if you you're worrying about can he can he talk then talk to him if you are getting right then ask him to write your essay on what happened in the last video game I mean you, you I don't suggest you can suggest they learn the things they need to learn if there's mathematics in a video game I don't know about it but it might be but in any case also I think mathematics is the most overtaught subject in the world there is no reason to be teaching it and, and jumping up and down about how we have to teach calculus we have to teach algebra no one uses that stuff it's you know one out of a million people ever will use it but it teaches you to think no it doesn't everything teaches you to think we we live in a world where of nonsense about it teaches you to think and i'm telling you the video games teach you to think too but no one's pushing them no i agree with you they they absolutely can teach you to think i, I think they they're severely um underrated and in fact they can be and they have been used effectively as teaching tools in fact uh, 
uh, Microsoft Minecraft is a is a perfect example. Uh, video games uh, video games have been used very effectively as teaching tools. So, um, uh, Doshank, I'd like to talk a little bit more about your own uh, uh, curriculum. So, your own story centered curriculum is uh, well known in educational circles. Our, our own uh, people have are, are, have have read about it and. Our verse connect. Um, can you maybe uh, tell us, tell me in the audience a bit more about your own curriculum and how it works? Well, our, we have hundreds of them. I mean, we build a lot of courses, but they all have the same basic structure. Here's a problem. Fix it. Uh, I don't know how to fix it. Okay. Well, here's some resources you could use to find out. Uh, here's some people you could talk to about it. What do you think the first step would be? Well, maybe try this. Well, try and see what happens. We're, it doesn't matter what the curriculum is. We're teaching you to be a doctor. We do the same thing. We hand you a very difficult patient you have to talk to, and you got to figure things out. You want to be a politician? We have a course on how to be a politician, how to deal with this. It's all doing stuff. So it's all about throwing you in situations, simulated situations, the best we can, of real life issues where you can figure something out and get good at it. And that's what there is to education. That's all there ever was to education. So there's also, um, you know, th there are a lot of people now saying that in the 21st century, you know, we're entering a phase where, you know, entire professions and jobs are going to disappear in the blink of an eye. So many things are going to be taken up uh, by AI and automation and that people oh, will need come on, to come on, come on. Uh, you know, that, don't believe everything you read in the newspapers. AI is not taking mm -hmm. over hardly anything. AI doesn't exist. They like to write about it, but it doesn't exist. It, it well, it's nice. about to take over driving jobs very soon. Um, you wow. know, well, I mean, you're not going to have drivers. I mean, uh, you you know, with autonomous First cars, so, you you, you drive in the car. I'm not not drivers are about to lose their jobs. I mean, that's not true. Almost, almost certainty. It's not true. I, I, you couldn't get me into a, into a self-driving car. I know perfectly well what the problems are in self-driving cars. Uh, it, something runs in front of you. Slam on the brake. Can you tell whether it's a, a dog, a cat, or a baby? And, and if it's a dog, would you feel differently than if it were a cat? And are you going to cause an accident because you, it's, a, it's, a, it's a squirrel and you don't give a damn about squirrels? So you can so those are the same decisions that a human being would make, right? How is the AI? Oh, those are the decisions that a, 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 an automated car has to make. There aren't going to be automated cars. It's very difficult to build. People have been saying this for years. I worked at the Stanford AI lab in 1968. There was a big sign over the parking lot, caution, mm -hmm. robot vehicle. 1968. We've been making these this bullshit up for a long time. It, 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 not, don't spend two seconds being afraid of what AI is going to do. There are jobs going to come and go based on a lot of other things. I mean, for example, I think at some point we have to outlaw plastic because it's everywhere and hooking over the world. So whoever manufactures plastic, I hope loses their job soon. <laughs> the reality is that we, the real problems we always have are the same, which is dealing with other people. And there will always be people jobs. And, and, and learning in the way I propose is actually very people intensive. It may be online, but you're constantly dealing with people, fictitious people or real people who are causing trouble. And you've got to figure out what you're going to do about them. And what we like to do is we like to give a lot of lip service to things. I had a mm -hmm. client, I won't name them, a very big company, who mm -hmm. hired me to build sexual harassment training. I said, well, just put up a girl on the screen and say, harass, yes or no? And, and so finally I came up with an answer. The answer was, I'll train you for a job you're never going to get to be the judge in a sexual harassment case of whether something bad happened. And people can present the cases, and you can determine what you think is right or what is wrong, and then you have to learn about it and ask questions, and I think that would be good. The people in this company loved it. They were so happy. What happens is the woman I were in charge of our of us was a, a very attractive girl. So I said, well, how is it? She says, well, if you don't mind the fact that the people in charge of the course are harassing me the whole time, it was fine. <laughs> no one has actually learned from taking a course. Okay, and, and the problem with courses is they don't actually work. You learn from real life. So the issue is to make courses as much like real life as possible. That's I, I absolutely agree with that. I think that uh, we do need to uh, do that, and uh, you know, I you know I, I sincerely hope that at some stage in the near future, um, universities do change the way in which they assess students, um, so that no, they schools won't. Are they can't. No, no, they can't. Universities, for example, uh, my secretary called me one day and said my daughter is going to going to school and she wants to go into merchandising of, 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 of clothing and they're requiring her to take an art history course. 
Why would she have to take an art history course? I said, because the art history faculty in that school lobbied very hard to make people take their course so they won't get fired. Because if no one takes their course, they'll get fired. So we made, they made her take an art history course. There is no reason for this. The reason required courses in college are always for the good of the faculty. They're not good for the good of the students. There's no reason to have a required course. But school after school has required courses because it's good for them. I'm just suggesting that universities have to rethink. They won't do it voluntarily. I was a professor for a long time. I wouldn't have agreed to rethink either. I like my lazy job where I don't have to do anything. The issue is, can you make the people start thinking about this differently? And you know, no university is going to stand up and say, we're going to change, because the faculty would kill them. Whoever, was, whoever announced that would be fired in a minute. But you have to understand that you could change. You could change. We've had this conversation before. And there's a question up here in the chat saying, would, would Dr. Shang come to Pakistan and set up a school for us? Yeah, I would make it work. Because the real issue is that you have to set up a school in a different way than you're doing. But you can't just do it without widespread approval of parents and, and teachers. That's the hard part. Correct. Well, Dr. Shank, um, you know, you'll be happy to know that you provided tremendous inspiration um, uh, to us. And even though we may not have reached your ideal model yet, um, you know, your views uh, from the initial SOT have definitely um, resonated with us and have pushed us to try to do whatever we can to make education more experiential, contextual, and closer to real life. But we're also, um, you know, I'm aware of the fact that we've just run out of time. It's It's been a great conversation, uh, uh, Dr. Shank. Again, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us one more time. And it's been enlightening and illuminating for me as it always is. Um, and I would like to also thank our viewers for joining us. I hope you've enjoyed this discussion. I'd also like to remind everyone to please uh, give us your feedback. You just have to go to the SOT website um, and give us your feedback. It will help us make these events more engaging and interesting in the future. But thank you, everyone, for joining us, and good night. Or good morning, depending on where you are. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye, Dr. Shank.